Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Industry Careers for PhDs podcast brought to you by Cheeky Scientist, and I'm your host, Isaiah Henkel. Uh, today, we have on Kyle Snyder. He is a global talent acquisition specialist. Uh, Kyle currently works with global talent acquisition, uh, and he's been in the industry for a long time uh, as a recruiter, as a hiring manager, helping professionals connect to each other, helping uh, biomedical, biotechnology, biopharmaceutical co uh, companies fill positions uh, for the roles that PhDs look for. Uh, he's held uh, several positions, including a senior recruitment consultant. Uh, he, he's been a writer for science, healthcare, and and, and in the technology industry. Uh, he he's also an experienced higher recruiting consultant, advisory board member, and uh, has has worked as a life science and healthcare account manager and, and recruitment lead manager. So lots of experience in the industry uh, when it comes to recruitment. Um, human capital, helping top-level companies uh, fill positions and find top-level PhD candidates. Uh, Kyle knows what he's talking about, and today we brought him on uh, to talk about many of these topics, and, and, and specifically how to think like a recruiter, how to prepare your resume uh, the way that a recruiter, uh, and to some extent a hiring manager, would want to see it. Uh, as always, if you are a Cheeky Scientist Association member, you have access to this full interview uh, in your private group and in your, your, your private uh, dashboard. Uh, if you want to receive these podcasts, these, these shorter podcasts, to your email, make sure that you go to our website, CheekyScientist.com, and, and sign up in the upper right-hand corner, and you'll have them delivered to you. Uh, if you want to become an associate, make sure you go to CheekyScientist.com backslash backslash association. All right, so we will jump in right here, uh, starting now with Kyle. Kyle, welcome, and thank you for being with us today. Absolutely. I appreciate the uh, opportunity to share here, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. Great. Well, yeah, so we'll, we'll dive right in here. Um, the first question I have for you is, is how do, and this is a question that we get a lot in the Cheeky Scientist Association group, um, you know, everybody wants to be sought out by others, right? <laughs> and uh, this, this applies to, to PhDs as well. How do, how do recruiters generally find candidates? So just very basically, as that, as that is a starting point, can you help us understand uh, the process? Sure. So an overview of, of the recruiting process, um, really recruiters, their jobs, I would say, fall into four buckets. Um, the first being you know, they spend a fair amount of time managing uh, their open requirements. And this is more of a behind-the-scenes thing that's done with the hiring managers, um, you know, get to meet with them on a regular basis, whether daily or weekly, and uh, get to know what they're looking for. Um, the second bucket would be more of uh, what people and candidates on the outside see. This is where they're actually sourcing candidates and coming up with strategies, where we're going to find uh, you know, the individuals that we need, um, with the backgrounds that we need, and how are we going to go about that. Um, another next step in the process is what I call the screening step, and this is where candidates are going through the interviews, phone screens, face-to-face -face interviews, uh, taking tours of facilities, uh, hmm. the whole nine yards of, of going through the interview process. And then another step that many people aren't aware of that recruiters are tasked with is the selection process. And this includes everything from hiring, onboarding paperwork, negotiating offers, um, kind of from that point where an offer is made all the way to you walk in your first day. So recruiters are, are tasked with not just reaching out, finding candidates, um, but doing a lot of behind-the-scenes things and why that's important um, for everyone here to know is the time they do spend reaching out to candidates is, is very limited um, on their end. So when they are mm. reaching out, having conversations, um, it might only be 15 or 20 percent of their time in a given week um, is, is looking for candidates. So, you know, that's, that's a very important part of their How much time? To make sure. I, I'd only say 15 or 20 percent of their week is actually spent reaching out um, okay. And identify new candidates. So very little. When it comes to, right when it comes to you know being seen and being recognized, um, absolutely that's a, a major piece of, of just getting through the interview process is being found. Well, great. Yeah. So I, I mean, I think that's a, a great takeaway because uh, a lot of people just assume that recruiters are spending 100 percent of their time out there looking for candidates. Uh, so keeping you know 
you, for those of you listening, that in mind is is that you have to really, really stand out uh, to to get noticed, and you know that's what I kind of want to go into next here. So that's how a, rec a recruiter might spend their day, um, and, and we we will come back to that with more more detailed questions. But uh, so looking at it from a different point of view, how can you know? Recru uh, people who are looking to be recruited, um, uh, particularly PhDs or, or high-level candidates uh, with, with academic backgrounds, um, what would you tell them to help them think more like a recruiter so they can re uh, you know, meet the recruiter's needs, and what, what advice would you give them into relation of how to get noticed, uh, make a recruiter's life as easy as possible, and actually have a recruiter contact them? Okay, sure. So. My recommendations, uh, as far as getting noticed, recruiters are typically looking for three points um, when they're searching candidates, whether it's on a job board or somebody who applied or on LinkedIn. Um, you know, and, and these are all keyword-based um, because that's how the technology is laid out. Recruiters, whatever they're using, however they're searching, just like you might get on Google, uh, you know, type in words to keywords to search. It's the same thing from a recruiting standpoint. Okay. Um, and oftentimes they're looking for three points, one being, you know, the instruments and, and techniques and methods that are needed for whichever job they're recruiting on. Um, so I can't emphasize enough, you know, how important it is to make sure you know, every method or test or, or, or procedure, you know, that you feel comfortable and experienced with that you do have that on your resume uh, because that will get you noticed. Um, the second point um, being more of, you know, what uh, years of experience, just the general work history, um, you know, that's always going to be a factor no matter what, you're, what field you're in. And the third being in what capacity, you know, have you used these instruments and test methods? Is it, is it an R&D side? Is it a very highly structured setting? Is it, um, you know, and on a more of a quality side? Um, that's something that a recruiter looks at initially, even from a resume standpoint. Um, you know, is this somebody who's been creating SOPs, or have they just been, um, you know, following some steps um, that I've already laid out? And it's not that one's okay. right or wrong. It's just whatever fits with what they're looking for. Um, so as far as getting noticed, you know, I would say, hey, make sure you clearly spell out any types of instrumentation, test methods, procedures. Yes. That you've done. Um, in addition to, uh, I've seen a lot of times people don't necessarily mention, you know, hey, this was in more of an R&D capacity, um, which might get you overlooked. Great. No, that's great advice, and it's very interesting. And for those of you listening, uh, you probably are thinking of the same question I'm about to ask. Is uh, you know, we have we have a lot of people that we've interviewed before that are hiring managers for jobs um, and and a lot of uh, high-level executives that do a lot of hiring we had one person during our last webinar that hired you know 50 or 60 people and and they all say that with the with the resume CVs they want to see results that's it they want to see an outcome that was achieved you know a specific outcome uh, they don't want to see job duties so what you're telling me here is that and this is something we you know, we've really encouraged and talked a lot about is to have individual resumes for different people, right, for each different audience. Um, so right. when it comes to recruiters, you're saying not so much results, but really talk about the methodologies, really talk about, you know, instrument names, the keywords, techniques, all this stuff uh, to get noticed by recruiters. And then if you get, uh, you have to put your resume through to a hiring manager, executive, it could be something else. Right. And that's, and that's where um, a lot of times the recruiters aren't on the technical end of the, of the interview process, right? That's where the hiring managers really dig in. It's been my experience mm -hmm. a lot of times too, where the hiring managers don't want to just know, you know, is this person, do they know how to perform this function? They want to know deeper than that. They want to know, does this person know the theory as to why we do this? And are they knowledgeable oh. enough that they can troubleshoot on their own if they need to, um, as opposed to, you know, just somebody who knows how to, um, you know, run a certain instrument. So from a, and that, that's a little harder to convey on a resume. And again, from a yeah. recruiter standpoint, that's necessarily why they don't look for that um, just on paper. Um, but keep that in mind as you go through the interview process that 
again, it's not just a list of job duties and skills. It's more of the level of understanding, um, which can translate into can this person work independently? You know, do they need um, supervision over their shoulder if something goes wrong? Um, which oftentimes managers, you know, they want to know, they want to have somebody on their team that is very self-sufficient, no matter what role or what industry it's in. Mm-hmm. No, that's that's uh, great, great advice. Uh, so just to kind of recap, uh, hiring managers uh, are, are, are looking for, uh, as opposed to recruiters, although I'm, I guess they could look for this too, is is can you troubleshoot? Uh, do you need constant supervision or are you self, self-sufficient? Going back to recruiters, we talked a little bit about how they have find candidates, but nowadays, what... Ooh, where do you see most of it happening? Is it mostly happening on LinkedIn? Where else might it happen? Um, if you could get really super practical, um, other than keywords, uh, h- how can a candidate make themselves uh, really kind of uh, sh- shine <laughs> or, or stand out or at least be noticed uh, to these sure. recruiters too? Sure. Um, I think LinkedIn is a very superior tool in the marketplace right now, both from a recruiter standpoint and a candidate standpoint. Um, it's really the only platform out there that allows a candidate um, to find recruiters uh, as opposed to waiting to be found, whether through applying on one of the major job boards or directly to you know, a company website. Um, and because of that, you know, I would recommend looking for recruiters uh, at companies that you may be interested in employment at and reaching out directly to them. And it is a little easier with the LinkedIn tool to identify who might be in a recruiting position there. Um, Recruiters uh, do typically appreciate that because, as we mentioned earlier, you know, they're only Hmm. spending 15, 20 percent of their week on average um, actively sourcing candidates. And if somebody comes to them um, and reaches out directly to them in a, you know, nice professional, friendly manner, um, it can save a lot of time for them, too. And it's the ultimate way to get noticed as a candidate um, because you're, you're taking the initiative to, you know, stand out from the crowd, reach out directly. Um, and not that you'd be surprised, not that many candidates uh, utilize LinkedIn in that way. A lot of them will treat it like another job board where they put a full, complete profile up, you know, with their resume. Um, and they just kind of sit there waiting mm-hmm. to be contacted. Yeah, uh, and I think that's a big mistake. Uh, well, th- that's that's a great strategy, and I don't think a lot of people are employing that. So, yeah, great, great advice. So, so, so moving forward, you know, what would your and getting more specific here to the the target, the you know, the people we're talking to currently, uh, knowing our audience, uh, what would be your advice for PhD graduates that let's say they have no industry experience, uh, but they want to apply to, you know, I guess more of these senior roles in R and R and D or advisory positions. Uh, maybe you know they want maybe even get away from the bench in, into sales marketing. You know what's the best way to do that that you've seen? Because I think there's always a, a difficulty for basically lifetime academics to move into their first job. Uh, what advice would you have to that end? Absolutely. Uh, I, I think the first goal and primary goal again is to make your resume stick in the recruiter's eyes. And the best mm-hmm. way to do this is to really focus on what transferable skills um, you might have towards, again, a specific position that you're looking to move into. Um, So there is always that roadblock of, like you mentioned, uh, you know, maybe not having any industry experience and you really want to get your foot in the door. Um, Oftentimes where candidates uh, fail, to be honest, is, is they try to transfer the fact that we have so many years of experience in an academic setting and just say, well, I have five, seven years experience, this should transfer well, as opposed to focus on individual skills, whether it's, you know, leading a team um, in a research project, again, specific instrumentation, um, Hmm. some of the intangibles, you know, ability to to critical think and and fast on my feet, uh, you know, a quick learner, Um, even, even having the right attitude, uh, those are things that are all transferable um, skill sets. And focusing on transferable skill sets will take you a lot further um, than just trying to focus on 
you know, I've, I've done research um, for the last five years. Why won't that qualify me for a position that requires five years' experience? Um, mm. That's just been my experience as the candidates that are able to successfully, you know, focus on individual tasks that they're proficient and have expertise in. Um, they go a lot further. Ah, uh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, no, it's, I, I definitely think that, you know, PhDs struggle with the idea of, you, like you said, you have five years of experience, uh, you think it should translate uh, automatically in some cases, that's what some people think, and other people think that there's no way it's going to translate, um, but it really just comes down to focusing on the methodology and, and the keywords, like you said. Um, and I really like the, this idea of having a, a resume specifically for recruiters. Uh, so, that, I mean, I think that's still the, the overall key takeaway here, you guys, is, is creating a, a, a resume CV that pops with exactly the words, keywords, instruments, techniques, methods, uh, procedures, everything that you've done, uh, so that the recruiters would know where to fit you. Um, so, what what kind of strengths do you see that are developed in academia that, that, that should be emphasized other than the methodologies? Is there anything that, that sticks out there in terms of uh, experience that's applicable to industry? Have you seen any kind of shining examples of someone who's, you know, fit it very well into a, a resume for a recruiter or hiring manager, any particular academic maybe uh, that, that uh, you know, just as an example that, that you can think of? Sure. Um, and, and a lot of it is so much case by case on what each hiring manager wants that it is really hard to say, you know, hey, if you do X, it's going to work well everywhere. Um, but at, at the end of the day, what it comes down to um, more times than not is the candidate's attitude and, and ability to, um, you know, ha having that eagerness to say, hey, an almost humbleness saying, hey, I, I know I don't have all the skills that you're looking for um, necessarily, um, but I do have, you know, and, and a level of expertise um, and critical thinking and research background um, that will really be looked upon. Um, but it, it's just very difficult, Isaiah, to, to really pinpoint one specific experience. And I think that's where, you know, the key, um, the key roadblock is in this entire conversation. Mm. Um, a lot of times some of the candidates that I've placed um, from academia into um, an industry role has been successful just because, you know, we've had the conversation from the beginning that, hey, I just want to get my foot in the door here. And I think this is a great opportunity to do that and mm. translating that to the manager. Um, most of the managers that I've seen that are most receptive to this um, are ones that oversee roles that are very highly creative, um, very high percentage of the duties are, are research-based um, because that is a very good um, type of position that translates well to academia. And, and I hate to, mm. you know, kind of dance around the question that you asked, but it, it really is um, so case by case that you, you can't really pinpoint, um, you know, one specific no, I think that's great. Or, or, or activity that will work across the board. Yeah, I, no, I think that was an excellent answer. I don't think you danced around it as so much as you just went right through it um, and, and said that really comes down to just transparency. Uh, you don't have a lot of experience in industry. Uh, don't beat around the bush. Just say, look, I'm trying to get my foot in the door. Uh, I don't have experience, but I do have these high-level skill sets, and clearly I am able to uh, stick with something and learn. I mean, uh, PhD is a degree in critical, I mean, basically a degree in critical thinking. <laughs> so uh, I really, really like that answer. And uh, on top of that, too, real quick, Isaiah, um, just to give a, a kind of paint a picture here, you know, during a normal week, a recruiter might look at one to 200 resumes, might only call oof, half of those uh, on a good week. Um, you know, and maybe end up screening 15 candidates in a week. And that, that's probably a good week. And my point being, if you can have that type of conversation with the recruiter up front and build that rapport 
and say, this is what I'm looking to accomplish. Uh, this is why I want to get my foot in the door. Um, mm. This is where I see myself in five years and why I want to get in the industry. That recruiter will then go to bat for you, you know, with the hiring manager. And at that point, you know, it, it's been whittled down already where the recruiter is probably only presenting four or five resumes. Um, so just by having that conversation up front with the recruiter, you know, you've increased your chances so much. Um, you know, you've already yes. beat out the other hundred some resumes, and now you have the recruiter who understands your motivation for applying for this job as opposed to, um, you know, just having a conversation trying to convince them why you're qualified. Excellent. I, you know, and I really love that what you were really hitting on there is telling the recruiter the reason why. <laughs> uh, not to get all philosophical here, but this is, it's a very powerful thing if somebody understands why you're doing something. And most of the times, uh, you know, like you just said, recruiters don't know that. Uh, so be, transparently tell them what you're looking to do and why you're looking to do it. Uh, great, great advice, Kyle. Thank you. Uh, a couple more uh, specific things here, uh, takeaways uh, I'd like to, like to get in is, you know, a lot of people have big questions and concerns about small things that they read on job postings. Uh, for example, uh, many positions request one to three years experience in industry, right? So how does a, uh, how does a candidate without that experience get around it? Uh, a lot of them also say that they want, uh, you know, a BS or an MS, uh, but their, their skills are, are a fit, you know, is it still worth the time for a PhD to try to apply? Um, any idea on, on, on those two to start? Sure. So uh, job descriptions um, are a very unique beast. They uh, have to incorporate a lot of uh, HR policy into them, um, which ends up, unfortunately, making them um, intimidating even sometimes because they have a whole laundry list of requirements and preferred requirements. Um, and at the end of the day, it's been my experience that sometimes, oftentimes, um, you know, maybe only 50, 60 percent of what's on that list um, is what the candidate who gets hired actually possesses. Um, a lot of it is hmm. listed because they, you know, they, they, it's an ideal state, and you know, every single task that's needed. Um, is not going to be possessed by the candidate who's hired. And my recommendation, you know, especially when you ask, uh, you know, requirements that list a, a bachelor's or master's degree, is it worth the time? Um, yes and no. I would say if it's a position that just required a bachelor's degree, um, you know, you might not have as good of a chance landing the position because a lot of times managers will say, well, this candidate, you know, he has a Ph.D., he might up and leave me for a higher level research role, you know, and I'll be look, stuck looking for uh, another job again. From a master's degree standpoint, I would highly encourage you um, to not overlook that. Um, to me, that tells me that the hiring manager, you know, puts mm -hmm. a lot of emphasis on higher education. Um, they'd probably even be thrilled to get PhD candidates. They might have just been um, a little hesitant to list that as a requirement on the job description because they might feel they might not get any applicants that way. Um, so the point, right. being, don't put too much stock in the job description. Um, just kind of look at some of the basics and try to filter out some of the noise because a lot of that's on there just to be on there. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's the recruiter's role um, to screen you out and it's not the job description's role to do that. So don't screen yourself out before you talk to the recruiter. Excellent. Great advice. And uh, the last question, Kyle, that I have um, is, you know, maybe you can talk about, because some people, they, they don't even know where to start in terms of their end goal. Like, what jobs do they even want to apply for? And I do think that really, I mean, PhD, PhDs especially can get jobs. Uh, I've seen a PhD anywhere from a, uh, uh, you know, administ doing administrative work to sometimes I've seen them get into production to heads of R&D to into management CEOs, whatever. But as far as making that first step, especially if it's their first job transitioning out, um, where maybe some positions that, you, that we wouldn't think of that you're seeing them move into um, directly from academia? Any examples? 
Uh, I, I think you, you brought up a good point that there is more um, going on currently into maybe some of more of the administrative um, non-laboratory uh, type of roles. Um, at the end of the day, just like you said, Isaiah, I've, I've seen PhDs um, end up in, in a wide variety of roles. Um, I, I don't think you should approach that mindset with what are roles that I'm qualified for and just approach it with a very more open mindset of, of what roles do I want to do. Um, you know, let's sit down and, you know, look in the mirror and say, well, what, I, what do I really want to do? What do I have a passion for? Um, you know, and, and then work backwards and say, okay, where yes. again are my transferable skills? Let's do some research into, you know, that particular job market. Um, because really, I, I don't think there is uh, any sectors or anything that stands out in my mind where by you having a PhD would hold you back. Um, so it's mm -hmm. really what you would want to do and what you, you know, would desire in, in your future and work backwards from there and tailor a resume towards that and, again, focus on the transferable skills that would transfer well into that particular specific job and uh, just keep whittling, whittling it down until you find, you know, uh, some positions that really match up with your interests. Uh, I just love everything you just said there, Kyle. <laughs> um, and, and you guys know these are themes that we've hit on over and over again. Uh, your PhD does not limit you at all. I mean, any of that limited thinking, limiting beliefs, um, you really got to get rid of that and, and start like Kyle said, and this wasn't prompted at all, start at the end as far as what you want to do. Look in the mirror. What kind of things do you want to, you know, what kind of job duties do you want to have? What do you want to wake up and do on a daily basis? And then work backwards, which is what Kyle said verbatim, work backwards uh, to figure out the job that's good for you. Um, so nothing is off the table. A PhD uh, c can do any of the positions you want to do. So uh, you choose first and and then go after it and and if you apply the techniques kyle 's been talking talking about here you know this, the overall arching strategies again some of the key takeaways uh, as far as focusing on keywords focusing on your audience in terms of recruiters creating a resume that that touches on methodologies for recruiters uh, perhaps a second one for hiring managers that focuses on uh, the results oriented uh, things they want to see showcasing your ability to think critically and to be self-sufficient. Uh, just lots of, lots of great stuff today. Um, Kyle, we really, really thank you for, for being here and for taking time out of your, your busy schedule. I mean, I, it sounds like everyone in this industry is, is very busy and short on time, so we are very appreciative. Um, thanks for coming on today. Thank you very much for having me. I do appreciate it. Thank you for joining us for another Industry Careers for PhDs podcast, again brought to you by Cheeky Scientist. Uh, if you want to receive the full version of this interview, as well as all the background materials and the show notes uh, and other supplementary materials for helping PhDs transition into industry, uh, make sure you sign up for the Cheeky Scientist Association waitlist, uh, as we do have an enrollment coming up. Uh, just go to cheekyscientist.com backslash association. And if you want to get these shorter, uh, these shorter edits of the interviews sent to you weekly, get, just get on our insider list by going to cheekyscientist.com and signing up in the upper right-hand corner. Until next time, remember your value as a PhD and start thinking and acting like a successful industry professional.